thank you very much, Emmanuel. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be here. Um, many of you may not know that Emmanuel and myself go way back, uh, further back than either of us would probably care to remember. But uh, uh, when we were a little bit younger than we are now, we were both at the Bentham Project in uh, in London, uh, where. Um, Emmanuel was pursuing her interest in utilitarianism and uh, I was editing some of Bentham's correspondence so it's very nice to be able to reconnect in a, in a different environment. So I want to talk to you today about uh, Adam Curtis who's a British documentary uh, filmmaker and uh, I think he's somebody who uh, to an audience of historians ought to be a very interesting guy. Um, he's uh, <coughs> excuse me, a BBC journalist and in the last 20 years or so, which is a phase of his career I've been covering, he's made at least eight uh, major uh, documentary movies that if you put them all together uh, provide I think quite an original narrative of uh, a lot of 20th century history uh, and also quite a contentious uh, narrative in many ways. So I'll give you an example. Um, when we think about post-war history, in the Anglophone world anyway, we tend to think of the sort of 1970s as a kind of turning point, a period 1945 to 1975 roughly is kind of Keynesian, middle way, uh, cooperative, socialistic in, in nature. After that, uh, you get the Thatcher-Reagan era, the turn towards neoliberalism, growth of markets and so on. Curtis uh, wants to really emphasise the continuities, not the differences in the second half of the 20th century. So he is arguing that the, the, the Thatcher and, and Reagan governments are in fact, in terms of their technocratic and rationalistic approach, very continuous with the previous sort of Keynesian era. So where a lot of people are seeing kind of a big, a big switch at the end of the 70s, Curtis is saying, no, this is much more uh, of a continuity than, uh, than most people like to make out. Uh, so that's kind of one example of the way he wants to challenge some contemporary narratives. So uh, what I want to do in the paper as a whole is give you um, an overview of his movies, try and put the arguments together from the different films and see what kind of narrative comes out of those. I'll take the films in turn. Then I want to talk a little bit about his style because one of Curtis's claims is that I'm a historian. Okay? Uh, we, we tend to think of historians as writing books, writing papers, but Curtis has actually said, you know, I am a historian. So uh, what are the implications, uh, what are the upsides, what are the downsides of um, doing history on film or trying to do history on film, if you like? Uh, <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about that. And then I'll finish off with some, I guess, uh, critical remarks about where, where Curtis gets to, and what, you know, what the overall uh, position amounts to. Um, so let me start off with uh, a film he made in 1992 called Pandora's Box. Now, he'd actually already been working at the BBC for about 10 years or so by this point, and there's a sort of interesting prehistory there that if we had more time, we could... <coughs> We could also talk about but Pandora's Box uh, I think is uh, an important movie because it's the first time Curtis really emerges with his own distinctive voice if you like it was clear from his earlier stuff he's interested in war and politics but this is the first kind of major multi-part documentary he makes where he offers a very wide-ranging interpretation of 20th century history now uh, Curtis's titles are often very significant so, so Pandora's Box you'll all remember uh, the ancient Greek myth where all the troubles of the world are kind of loosed when, when Pandora's box is opened uh, as a result of a kind of unrestrained curiosity and Curtis is referencing this myth uh, as a way of introducing what is a kind of very sweeping critique of I would say rationalism and scientism in the 20th century now just to be clear about that uh, he is not attacking reason and science simply as such. Um, what he's attacking is, I guess, the uh, belief that rationality and scientific methods, just in the abstract, can uh, provide solutions to political problems. And uh, he takes a variety of examples. Remember, this is a six-part movie. 
So he covers Russia, he covers the USA, he covers the UK, Africa, and he takes some very varied case studies. He looks at central planning in the Soviet Union. He looks at game theory and the logic of mutually assured destruction in the Cold War. He looks at uh, the Volta River Dam project in West Africa. He looks at some of the nuclear disasters of the 1970s and 1980s, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and, uh, and tries to argue that all these very disparate kind of phenomena uh, in which things end up going badly wrong. This is the common theme, that all these kind of schemes just, uh, just fall apart in one way or the other. Uh, the, the reasons for the failure is a, is a common one. Now, of course, in a way, this isn't a new critique, okay? Um, if you look at Anglophone thought in the mid-20th century, you can find plenty of major names. Karl Popper would be one. Friedrich Hayek would be another. I think Oakeshott would probably be a third. of People who are criticising rationalism, uh, the idea that we can... Uh, straightforwardly apply scientific method to political problems is doomed to fail because politics and the realities of life are just too contingent, too contextual to admit of having a single framework imposed on them. So Curtis is kind of lining up, whether he knows it or not, I think, in, in, in this kind of tradition of, of critics of rationalism. And this is this is a theme that kind of goes forward through a lot of the subsequent movies and helps to kind of knit everything together. The next major movie I want to talk about that he makes uh, comes out three years later. It's called The Living Dead. And there's a useful distinction that uh, Michael Oakeshott likes to draw between what he calls the historical and the practical past. And the practical past is, I suppose, uh, the past as we encounter it in memory and in, in culture. And um, it's kind of distinguishing hallmark is that it's, it's a useful past. And on a personal level, imagine if you got up in the morning and you didn't know who you were. You'd be in a lot of trouble. So there's a, there's a kind of useful past of memory. But just culturally, civilizationally, we need the past to kind of orient us. But the, the key thing here is that when we're dealing with the past in politics, which is an instance of the practical past... Um, the past in politics is never about the past. This is Oakeshott's point. The past in politics is always about the future. And of course, this is, this is a very different take on the past to the past of a sort of academic historian where you're trying to explain the past in terms of its own past. You're not primarily interested as a historian in the significance or relevance of the past looking forward. You're interested in why a certain event happened and you can't explain that in terms of its subsequence. You can only explain it in terms of what kind of led up to it. So... Curtis is interested, when, he, when he's talking about the living dead and the role of the past, it's not the historical past generated by historians he's got in mind. It's, it's the, the myths of the past in public life that he's really concerned with in this movie. And in the first part, he tackles, uh, I suppose, the allied memory of the Second World War. And uh, his argument here is that um, the Allies at the Nuremberg trials and elsewhere took a very selective attitude to uh, what had happened in the Second World War. Curtis's point here is not to try and exonerate the Nazis but to point out that in order to win a war you have to do terrible things yourself and uh, the kind of covering up of the terrible things that the Allies had to do to win uh, and the demonisation of Nazism, the, the lack of a serious engagement on the part of the Allies with, with essentially why Hitler had been so popular, uh, led to a, a more prevalent attitude in the 1950s, 1960s, where um, essentially, uh, because we won, we must have been the good guys. Particularly in respect to the American foreign policy, uh, the, 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 there emerges a very sort of uncritical uh, attitude of uh, you know, having won the war, this sort of then legitimates anything that anybody uh, in, in American foreign policy really wants to do. And, and uh, also cultivates um, a lack of patience with opposition, a lack of willingness to listen to alternative arguments. The second part of the film, having, having looked at kind of public memory, then Curtis turns to, uh, I guess, uh, more individual memory and, and, and starts to talk about some uh, of the phenomena around the Korean War is his, is his beginning point where the Americans found out when they, they recaptured some of their soldiers who'd been taken by the Chinese that the, these soldiers had been 
very effectively kind of reprogrammed, if you like. Uh, they, they'd, be, they'd absorbed a lot of Chinese propaganda, and the Americans could not get them thinking the right way, if you like, again. So what have the Chinese done to them? The term brainwashing comes into use in this era as a result of the um, Korean War, actually. There's a Chinese phrase which literally means wash brain, and so the English term brainwashing, I think, uh, there's a French equivalent as well, um, is a direct literal, literal translation of the Chinese. And Curtis is very interested in how the CIA in particular pick up on these kind of thought control experiments to try and see if you can give people a completely fresh set of memories um, and all, all the kind of electric shock treatment and so on that, that uh, is, is carried out in this era is, is uh, done with the idea partly in mind of just even re actually reprogram people's minds. And this all fails. Uh, but what comes out of it, uh, officially speaking, he argues, is... Um, uh, a whole new kind of set of military applications. The, the original idea is if we treat the brain like a computer, maybe we can get people thinking the way we want them to. And that doesn't work. It turns out people are not computers. But there is a possibility of going the other way. What if we could make a computer like a brain? Okay. And turn that to technological account. Then what would happen? So out of this failed experiment at kind of thought control, memory control, comes a new generation of AI research, which is very readily weaponizable, as it proves. So a lot of work on machine vision comes out of this kind of research field, giving missiles the ability to, as it were, see their target, store a picture of their target, match up that picture against the actual target, and then, and then launch a strike and so on. This, this is the ultimate background to, uh, to this new generation of weapons that are first used in the Gulf War. So control of memory, control of thought is very important in, uh, in, in this area as well. So the first part of the movie is kind of morals, if you like, Nuremberg and the Allied memory of the war. The second part deals with technology and the third really goes to national identity and, and uh, in particular, Curtis now is talking about Thatcherism, which Emmanuel told me she was very glad to hear I was gonna talk about, she was teaching it earlier. So um, Curtis emphasizes the way in which nationalism is crucially bound up with a kind of mythologization of the past. Um, it allows politicians to summon up a kind of romantic vision which can give them great power temporarily, but, but in the end uh, tends to have revenge effects of uh, a pretty drastic sort. So Thatcher in particular, uh, he emphasises the influence of Winston Churchill on Thatcher's rhetoric. The, the Thatcherite vision of Britain and British greatness was, was heavily filtered through the way in which Churchill had, uh, had portrayed Britain. But the problem, as Curtis pointed out, was that already uh, Churchillian rhetoric was based on a very outmoded conception of Britain's situation. By the 1940s, the British Empire that Churchill was valorising was very much on the way out. Uh, what killed the British Empire, as you all know, was really World War I. It made the British Empire unaffordable. In the 1920s, 1930s, it's already clear that uh, this is uh, a declining uh, entity. But Churchill makes great rhetorical uh, use of Britain's imperial destiny in the Second World War to mobilise support against uh, the Nazis. However, when Thatcher revives this 40 years later in the 1980s, it's kind of doubly uh, false, if you like. Uh, initially, it was based on a false premise of uh, the continuing glory of the British Empire. Now it's based on a, a false premise about a false premise, if you like. And Thatcher uh, makes great capital out of this early in her premiership around the Falklands. But um, arguably, Curtis says, it only uh, made her more vulnerable later on, this aura of kind of mythical nationalist invincibility she'd cultivated thanks to the Falklands uh, made her <coughs> actually much more liable to political destruction when she faced a serious challenge over the poll tax. So these various ways in which the past figures in, in, in politics uh, become a, a major concern for him as well as the, the, the rationalism and the scientism after these first two movies. Then there's a movie he makes which for the British historians amongst you, I would like to spend more time on, but it, it's, it's kind of too British and too specific to, to really actually uh, be something I can say an awful lot about, but the Mayfair set. Mayfair is a very smart district of London, you probably know. 
Um, in the 60s, Curtis argues, there was a very important London club, the Claremont Club, where you had uh, entrepreneurs and adventurers, really, people like uh, Tiny Rowland and James Goldsmith, if you know anything about the history of British business after the Second World War. These were the guys who essentially pioneered asset stripping in the 60s and 70s, buying a company, breaking it up, selling off the component bits of the company for more than the, the, the bits of the company itself was uh, initially worth. And um, this is what is really behind the, the, the business shift of the 70s and 80s, not so much neoliberalism, but this culture which developed uh, in, in British uh, uh, elite uh, circles. This is what Curtis is attributing the kind of so-called Thatcherite revolution to. So giving it a very different foundation to what it normally has. Um, and it's this approach which he argues uh, underlies what he sees as the main trend in the last third of the 20th century so far as politics and business goes, which is the transfer of power from politics to business. So people like Thatcher and Reagan are not so much initiating neoliberalism, founding it, starting it, creating it, as they are kind of being swept along by already existing tides dating from the 1960s that are, that are kind of pushing them uh, in a direction they wouldn't necessarily want to go, but which they kind of can't help uh, to do anything about. So that's the Mayfair set. Again, it's a four-part film, uh, and I, I can only scratch the surface of it there, but, but very focused on British political economy specifically. A much more wide-ranging film made in 2002 is uh, The Century of the Self, which is his way of talking about the 20th century. Um, the 20th century is the century of the self, and he started off with the arrival in America of Sigmund Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays. And what Bernays did was start to apply Freud's psychoanalytic insights to advertising. Advertising, if you look at it in the 19th century, tends to be very sort of information based, very textual, uh, just here are facts about this product, here's how much it costs, here's where you can buy it. Modern advertising, as you all know, very much about creating desires making people want stuff that they didn't know they wanted. And essentially, uh, Bernays is the person who uh, pioneers this approach. And when government sees what Bernays is doing, they're very, very interested in using these techniques uh, to manipulate public opinion, particularly given the threat of socialism in the 1920s, 1930s, controlling democratic public opinion and making sure democracies want the right things is a very important tactic. Somebody like Walter Lippmann would be very important in this uh, context in America. Uh, the notion of public opinion and controlling public opinion. And then after the Second World War, you have this new era of prosperity uh, that uh, emerges uh, as a result of the war. And now uh, we have this new... Um, institution of the focus group and of course this is all about selling people if you like the myth of individuality because from a focus point of view focus group point of view you're a category right but we market to you like you're an individual in fact you're just one of a bunch of people like you okay so there's this uh, there's this sort of false premise of individualism that's being cultivated as a marketing device so there's a, a deep complicity that Curtis sees between the so-called counterculture of the 1960s, the hippie movement and so on, and capitalism. Insofar as there was a real revolt against authority in the 60s, uh, Curtis thinks it was a disaster. Uh, the communal movement, uh, and in America this was, this was a big deal. Maybe half a million people, Curtis says, left the cities to try and found communes, and almost all of these things fell apart overnight well, very quickly, within two or three years, because there was no institutional control on them. There was no, no kind of, there was essentially no policeman uh, to go to. So the, the, the power dynamics in communes were very unregulated and uh, essentially became just a kind of ego contest. People just dropped out. They, they, they couldn't cope with having no formal equivalent for the rule of law, essentially. 
But the problem is that in wider society, the rule of law is being undermined by this logic of uh, capitalist marketing, which is becoming increasingly popular. So Curtis is developing a very gloomy world picture here. You can see as he goes through this sort of second half of the 20th century, approaches the, the contemporary era, he's getting more and more um, dystopian, if you like. And around, uh, around 2004, he makes a movie called The Power of Nightmares, which is the one that probably really makes his reputation. Um, he's been a kind of post-Cold War guy to this point. Now he's a post-9-11 guy as well. And uh, <laughs> this movie um, was so controversial for a while that no TV network in America would touch it. It's been shown over there now, but for the first few years, no one would show it. Why? Well... It, eff it effectively rubbished the official account of Al-Qaeda as an international terrorist network. Um, Curtis's starting point was, look, Bin Laden and those guys, they were failures. They were attacking the West out of desperation. They had tried to bring about Islamic revolution in their own countries and they had completely failed. Attacking America was the kind of last gasp effort to try and do something to, to radicalise Islam. Um, in the West, Bin Laden and co. were portrayed as, you know, masterminds of a international terror network. No such thing. So Curtis is not trying to downplay the seriousness of terrorism, but he is trying to question the way in which Western politicians have officially represented it. And one of the things I think that made him particularly controversial was an equivalent, equivalence he makes between... Uh, the ideas of Saeed Qutb, who is the leading intellectual of the what became the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which along with, I guess, Saudi Wahhabism is probably one of the two main forces behind modern Islamic radicalism. The equivalence he makes between Qutb's ideas and those of Leo Strauss, who, uh, as you know, is a German emigre who goes to University of Chicago and becomes very influential in Chicago over uh, subsequent generations of neoconservative uh, thinkers. Now, um, Curtis's point is that both Kutub and Strauss are reactionaries um, who are very hostile to modern democracy. In Kutub's case, he wants to get back to the early years of Islam, the, the sort of first century or so after the Prophet. In uh, Strauss's case, it's either the early years of the American Republic uh, or uh, ancient Western democracy, the, the Greco-Roman experience, which is the time of virtue in, uh, in Western politics. And so um, the idea that Islamism and neoconservatism are kind of structural mirror images of one another seems to be original to Curtis. I haven't seen anyone else putting this forward. The relationship of Straussianism to neoconservatism is well documented. Okay, lots of people have pointed out that people like Wolfowitz and so on uh, in the American administration have a kind of Straussian intellectual background. This is well known. But the idea that these Straussian guys were actually in a way the structural, functional equivalence of the Islamists uh, is, I think, uh, something that Curtis uh, is um, uh, original in, uh, in putting forward. Um, and so he's arguing here that one of the, the chief characteristics of, the, of, of ideology in general, I think, is oversimplification. Islamism and neoconservatism both rest on fantasies of an imaginary past. And this is, of course, the big theme of The Living Dead, the, the, the movie I discussed earlier. It's the same kind of thing carried forward, that fantasizing a, a kind of pure age of innocence of some kind and the need to get back to it is a kind of classic um, ideological smokescreen, if you like. Um, and this also, I think, uh, leads to a general observation about Curtis's approach that he's really uh, a man for ideas. So far as historical explanation goes, ideas are really crucial. In contrast to, for example, some kind of economic determinism, where everything is about uh, structural market forces, or perhaps, uh, I don't know, you could see everything in terms of demography or what have you. Um, Curtis is, is very much uh, insistent on the position that we have to understand what people thought they were doing. Even if what happened was not what they expected, even if unintended consequences are the norm, we still need to understand the ideas that were in the minds of the actors who were uh, involved. Okay, So uh, this is one of the things that I think makes him unusual and interesting as a documentary filmmaker, 
is, is the airtime he's prepared to give to political ideas. Um, sometimes he gets called a conspiracy theorist, uh, but um, and particularly after the power of nightmares, that was a charge, but he, he denies this. I mean, he's been confronted over this and says, no, the, the point I'm making uh, about the way in which Western politicians uh, have used terrorism to kind of control and repress their own populations, they didn't set out to do this. It kind of dropped in their lap. It was a very convenient thing for them, but it's opportunism, not conspiracy, that he sees as being behind the way in which Britain and America have responded to uh, terrorism. So moving forward to uh, <clears throat> the last three movies that I want to talk about. Um, in 2007, he made uh, one called The Trap. And uh, this kind of combines the critique of rationalism that we get in Pandora's box with <clears throat> the worries about individualism and the, the kind of shaky basis for modern individualism in the century of the self. So The Trap puts forward the idea that... Um, thinking about individualism in exclusively calculative rational terms has had significant revenge effects in uh, the modern era. Game theory uh, is, is singled out. Also rational choice in political economy. Uh, he mentions James Buchanan and John Nash. Um, but also some, some ideas that you perhaps wouldn't expect, uh, not just from political economy, but from genetics. Uh, he makes quite a lot out of the popular reception of biological ideas. Uh, for example, the notion of the selfish gene, which he argues encourages a view of society as composed of just self-interested individuals competing against one another. Uh, and he's not saying this is what biologists actually think. He's saying that this is the way in which the public took up the idea and were encouraged to kind of think about society in the public realm. Not that this has anything to do with what biologists actually believe. But the, the upshot is uh, a society dominated by uh, Isaiah Berlin's negative liberalism, which he interprets to mean as a, <coughs> a society without any ideals other than individuals' desires and the freedom to indulge them. And there's no possibility here of a kind of activist politics or an emancipatory politics. What you've got now is a society of kind of isolated, atomized um, consumers. And this is followed up by another movie, um, which has a great title, All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. Okay, uh, And All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace is actually a poem from the 1960s by a poet called Richard Brautigan. And uh, it's a kind of techno-utopian poem where uh, nature and technology are going to fuse into some kind of benign uh, environment for human beings that are kind of pastoral and idyllic. And again, this is Curtis kind of taking a title and ironising it, if you like. And he starts out uh, with another major figure in the history of 20th century ideas, uh, Ayn Rand. Um, you may know Ayn Rand for her kind of hyper-individualistic uh, approach. What Curtis is interested in is the way in which this got transmitted to two particular spheres, uh, Silicon Valley and computing on the one hand, and political economy on the other. Alan Greenspan, who was chairman of the US Federal Reserve for 13 years, was a Randian, was a member of the inner circle, very close to Ayn Rand, uh, also, um, the idea of a self-organising society that Rand popularises, that if you just leave individuals alone, they'll act in a dynamic way. If government doesn't interfere with them, they, they will sort themselves out. This idea is also very appealing in computing. The notion of the self-correcting algorithm is analogous to the idea of the self-correcting market. If you just leave the market alone, if you just leave the algorithm to run, uh, you don't interfere with it, you don't over-regulate it, you will get some kind of spontaneously evolving social order. Okay. Now, as we all know, this has turned out to be far too optimistic as a way of thinking about how uh, computers can, can uh, run markets in particular. The point is that originally this was a very emancipatory, I guess, egalitarian idea. It is, after all, California which is pushing this in many cases, the idea that computers can liberate us 
comes from Silicon Valley, it's progressive, it's utopian, it's rationalist, and it leads us uh, increasingly to uh, disaster, the, to the effort to, to use computers to manage our finances in a way that led us to stop paying serious attention to how we were evaluating risk, for example. Um, and there's a deeper metaphor he sees at work uh, as well. Uh, I've talked about ideas coming from biology. In particular, he, he picks up on the notion of an ecosystem uh, which emerges in, uh, I guess, studies of nature in the first half of the 20th century. The notion that the natural order has a balance to it, which is kind of inherently self-correcting. Um, but Curtis's point is there is no such thing as a balance of nature. That's just a metaphor. It's a metaphor that comes from engineering and from the idea of feedback loops in engineering. And we can't actually assume that either nature or society have these kinds of self-regulating mechanisms built into them that uh, will effectively allow us to suspend our own judgment if only we can get the system right. So he's seeing, uh, I suppose, uh, an increasing tendency uh, for us to abdicate responsibility uh, to technology, which has eroded uh, capacity for, on the one hand, moral judgment, and on the other hand, uh, any belief in the possibility of changing the situation. And in his most recent film, um, he actually starts uh, with the declaration that increasingly we live in a world where nothing makes sense. So uh, we get a kind of passage through dystopianism uh, into uh, almost complete uh, meaninglessness. By uh, It's more or less where he seems to be right now. This is Bitter Lake, which came out in uh, 2015. The attempt to supply a kind of narrative for contemporary events, which he's talking about in The Power of Nightmares, where the, the politicians use terrorism to sort of shape a, a kind of narrative, or in The Living Dead, where, where the, 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 the recourse to nationalism is, is the way in which you set up the narrative. All of these things are, are breaking down. So we're living through an era of kind of complete collapse, uh, in, in, in his uh, opinion. Um, Bitter Lake is, is particularly concerned with Afghanistan. Uh, Kurt is very interested in the Middle East, obviously the problem of terrorism uh, <coughs> and, and where that comes from uh, leads him to spend quite a bit of time exploring the roots of Islamism. But in this latest movie, he argues that Afghanistan has been a kind of blank canvas for Western rationalist optimism and that successive generations have, have gone into Afghanistan, tried to reshape it in basically complete ignorance of what was done previously. And he has <clears throat> what has to be one of the best examples I've ever seen of what political scientists call revenge effects, okay, in Bitter Lake. So Helmand province in the 1950s, the Americans are there at the invitation of the king. Afghanistan is still a monarchy at this point. And uh, in order to help modernise Afghanistan, they do a lot of dam building. Okay, now I'm no engineer, but according to Curtis, when you build a dam, or when they built these dams in Helmand Province, one of the effects was to raise the level of the water table. Okay, this made the soil saltier. When you have salty soil, this is very good for growing poppies. Anyone see where this is going yet? When the Russians invade, and the Russian invasion is to be understood as its own effort to create a kind of idealised society. Curtis argues that you don't understand the Russian intervention in Afghanistan unless you understand it as also partly an effort to redeem the failures of the USSR by having another go at creating an ideal communist society. So Russia was in its own way trying to democratise Afghanistan by invading it, not simply uh, treating it as a kind of real politic exercise, but actually trying to reshape Afghan society in the same way that the West did both before and after the, the, the Russian effort. When the Russians invade, the Afghans, of course, start growing poppies like crazy because that way uh, they can sell the heroin to get the guns to fight the Russians. But this, of course, creates the Taliban, who, of course, are then the people who America has to fight, uh, you know, in uh, the 2000s when it invades. But it's having to fight people who are using 
uh, the guns bought with the money from the drugs that grew soil that you know was kind of fertilized by them thanks to their uh, dam building efforts back in the 1950s so this is a kind of beautiful vicious circle that, that Curtis uh, identifies and of course it also makes the problem of tribalism far worse because the heroin trade is so lucrative but it's not just about fighting the Soviets uh, all the different kind of warlords and, and, and tribal groupings now have a vested interest in trying to grow as much poppy as they can control as much of a heroin trade as they can uh, <coughs> to, um, to enrich themselves so uh, this is where Curtis uh, kind of ends up with um, an idea of the West as, I guess, hopelessly amnesiac, it's repeatedly causing its own problems through through a very well-intentioned kind of rationalist optimism that completely ignores history and completely ignores the context, completely ignores the past. That and he's he's got a new film out uh, in about three days' time called Hypernormalization which is all about this idea that there's no alternative, we can't do anything differently. And, and this is, I think, uh, a, a direct follow-on from Bitter Lake. So I'm very interested to see this new movie. Uh, it should be coming out in just a few days' time. So I hope that's given you uh, a little bit of a sense of some of the ideas that come out of the films. And I want to move now to talk a little bit about, the, I guess, the filmmaking style and the use of TV as, as a way of doing um, history. Uh, one of, I suppose, uh, the features of the style, I've mentioned his ironising titles. Um, his, his whole approach is, I think, heavily biased towards the ironic. Now, you might say that history, just as a discipline, uh, is, a, is a kind of ironic discipline insofar as so much of history deals with unintended consequences. It's one of the first things you kind of learn as a historian is that, you know, but as Marx put it, people make their history, but they don't shape it exactly as they will. Uh, so there's a kind of inbuilt irony almost to, to studying history. But, but Curtis sometimes seems to take, you know, a positive pleasure in the absurdity of the outcomes that history generates. And for me, uh, <coughs> this rather crosses the line. The, the, the dominant mode of history is kind of analytical and, uh, and, and critical in, in our own time. Curtis, I think, tends to depart from this a little bit too much in the direction of, of irony. And also, he ends up in a bit of a paradoxical place. By if, if he's really committed to this idea that everything is now meaningless, um, well, he's doing an awful lot of explaining for somebody who thinks that we can't understand things anymore. And I think he rather conflates modern feelings of a lack of significance or worth or value with a lack of intelligibility. Significance is a kind of ambiguous term in this way, and um, I think uh, he, he leans too much towards the idea that things don't make any sense in an intelligible way, when what he means is we, 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 we feel rather nihilistic, like we don't know what we're living for, which is another kind of question. He sort of runs these two things together a bit. Um, but stylistically, he's problematic as well. If you've watched an Adam Curtis movie, and Emmanuel tells me she did watch some of his stuff when I told her I was going to give this talk and she liked it, but he can be a bit like watching a pop video, you know? It's kind of like almost MTV style. One of Curtis's things is collage. He likes mashing images together from all over the place. Um, he's done some work with, uh, I don't know if any of you are into uh, pop music, but Massive Attack. Uh, he was at school with a couple of members of English punk bands who became quite famous, Gang of Four, named of course after the uh, Maoists who were put on trial in China after Mao's death, and the Mekons. So he's got these kind of punk uh, connections, and he, he, he really likes pop soundtracks. He, he, he chooses his soundtracks very carefully, often using a lot of kind of punk and pop music. And the whole effect is kind of music video-ish. And a lot of people have said, well, you know, okay, you're claiming to do historical research because he, he calls himself a historian who mix ideas and techniques from art and pop music. But he is, he is claiming to be a historian. And people say, well, look, if you're a historian, then, you know, just throwing images together this way, uh, that makes you look like you're not serious. His response is, well, you know, <clears throat> I, want <to> get <coughs> Excuse me. I want to get people interested. I want to entertain. And so all of this 
is just kind of surface stuff. And in a way that's quite consistent with the other element of the films, which is the voice. As what ties Curtis's movies together is very much his narrative voiceover. He doesn't put himself in front of the camera. Different documentary filmmakers do different things. If you watch like Michael Moore movies, Michael Moore can barely resist any opportunity to get himself in front of a camera. Adam Curtis almost never appears on film, but you just hear this disembodied voice telling you stuff, interpreting it all for you. And for somebody who's being very provocative and controversial, there's no hesitancy or doubt in that voice. It's always very assured. This is a kind of master narrator uh, type style. He never uses the word I. There's no first person pronoun. It's just very declaratory. And um, this uh, is in real contrast to the, the kind of style of the images that, that you're getting. There's a kind of tension between, between the voice and between the images, but in the end, it's, it's the voice which is dominant. It's the voice which makes sense of it all and which lets us put together the kind of narrative that I've been giving you. Um, if you had to compare Curtis to a political thinker, who would he be? Uh, Emmanuel was talking to me about prominent French intellectuals these days and said, oh, we don't have anyone like Michel Foucault anymore in France. Well, if you gave Foucault a movie camera and made him English, you would probably have somebody quite like Adam Curtis. Um, he, <clears throat> he wants to look at systems. He says, uh, let's look at how the power flows through the system. This does sound very, very Foucauldian, but I think there's a difference there in that insofar as Foucault is usually identified with kind of left politics, Curtis describes himself as, on the one hand, progressive, but also um, libertarian. So uh, in some ways, as he himself points out, he can sound quite right-wing. Um, for instance, uh, if neoconservatism criticises the breakdown of social bonds and communal networks, well, this is something Curtis also deplores. So um, despite the similarity to Foucault with an interest in power and so forth, he's not a straightforwardly kind of left-wing <coughs> thinker either. And uh, I think that's an important point to emphasise. Now, <coughs> on the virtues of using TV altogether, um, well, pros and cons... What's the major pro? You get a huge audience. When Bitter Lake aired, I think it got 1.2 million viewers for his most recent movie. And that, that's just obviously the first screening. That's not like internet viewings and so on. But if you can do history on film in this way, then, I mean, you have a chance to attract an audience. Very, very, very few academic, audience, uh, academic uh, writers can, can ever reach. You know, you, most historians... If a few hundred people read my book, I'm delighted. Never mind, you know, 1.2 million. But of course, the downside is that uh, working with words, well, words have fixed definitions. There's a basic unit of meaning, linguistically, the sentence. With the image, no such thing. There are no definitions of pictures. There's no basic pictorial unit of meaning. Everything is up for grabs with interpretation. And this is why the voice is so important, because the images by themselves, obviously, uh, certainly with no context for them, uh, don't mean anything. You need the, the, the narratorial voice in order to uh, tie it all together. And um, what makes things worse is not just the nature of the image, but also the medium that uh, if you've ever tried to do any work with video compared to working with text, it's awful. I mean, like with a book, you can sort of you flip back and forth, but the, all the rewinding and fast forwarding, it just kills you. There's no bibliography, there's no footnotes, there's no kind of critical apparatus of any kind. Where did that image come from? What am I looking at? I've really got no idea. So compared to uh, the kind of traditional uh, linguistic textual medium of history, doing it this way is very problematic just from the point of view of source criticism but how do we evaluate the evidence that he's giving us independently it's very very difficult uh, even archivally speaking i can't just walk into the bbc archives and start watching this stuff okay in the same way that i could go to the bibliothèque nationale and order up some document that some historian has looked at and see that for myself you know so, so tracing curtis's sources back is 
is uh, very, very difficult. And, and that makes things, of course, uh, extremely problematic. So you end up, <coughs> you end up taking a great deal more uh, on trust than you would if you were reading a kind of traditional historian. And when somebody is making quite radical claims, uh, like Curtis's, this, this is uh, obviously very, very uh, problematic indeed. So for all the brilliance of the ideas, there are these problems with the medium and the execution, which uh, certainly uh, raise a lot of difficulties. And so far as the substantive conclusions go as well, um, on the one hand, Curtis has a very good critique of rationalism and scientism uh, as utopian and as always tending to undermine themselves. On the other hand, he deplores the absence of a progressive politics. Well, the problem is that 20th century progressivism was largely informed by the very trends that he's criticising. The, uh, the use of science and the use of reason were designed to liberate humanity and insofar as these things have gone terribly wrong and we're dealing with broken dreams this is of course uh, a very sad situation but um, to then be calling for more progressivism after you've spent you know 20 years kind of criticizing the outcomes of the failures of it uh, seems to be odd and I, I found the conclusion to the most recent film it's a bit of like very disappointing in this respect he says we need a new story uh, one we can believe in well for somebody who spent, again, all this time cultivating something like what uh, Lyotard, for example, might call an incredulity towards meta-narratives, then demanding a new story just, just seems almost contradictory. I mean, Curtis presents you with history as a tale of complexity, history as a tale of a contest of interest of power, history uh, as, a, as a story in which the, the use of the past is always a, a vital thing. And what you would expect of someone like this is to say, well, look, surely in future we just need to be much more sceptical about our own claims. We need to stop believing that we can have rapid political transformations that can you know, deliver us into a new utopian situation. And if we're going to have profound political change, it's going to be a very, very long, slow process. There's no easy fix. There's no quick fix coming up with a new story is, is really not going to cut it, you would expect somebody like that to say. So I, I find uh, Curtis's lack of a kind of positive agenda uh, you know, a, a real shortcoming. He, he, he seems to have uh, arrived in, a, in a, a position that's very unconvincing for me. Does that mean you shouldn't watch his movies? Absolutely not. I think Curtis is one of the most brilliantly creative people uh, one of the most original historical documentary filmmakers of, of recent decades and with any thinker or filmmaker or historian whatever it is uh, I don't think it's about saying yes or no to them I mean was Marx right about what I mean he had a lot to say Curtis has a lot to say the point is uh, the, the people who are worth reading or watching are the people who make us engage with them I mean I, I found Curtis so interesting I, I wrote a whole paper about him, you know. Uh, to do it, I had to take his movies and turn them back into text, you know. I had to transcribe, or my poor long-suffering research assistants had to transcribe all the images, all the voiceover, you know, turn it back into... I've got piles of, of kind of scripts of Adam Curtis movies that I've, I've kind of made in order to do this, but the thing is that his films are so kind of interesting and provocative and engaging and make you want to do this and pick them apart and for me you know that that's the measure of somebody uh, who is really worth engaging with that they they make you want to give them this kind of critical attention and so this experiment with trying to do history on film trying to do uh, kind of documentary television history uh, is, is, is very worthwhile for, for that it's extremely stimulating and engaging to get somebody who's got such a an original vision of what the 20th century has been about even if it's wrong that's okay uh, and or at least partly wrong i don't think he's all wrong by any means but you know the fact is you know we can't buy everything he says never mind he is still very much worth watching there's a, a good website thoughtmaybe.com where you can find most of his movies a lot of them are also on youtube if you haven't seen any of them i'd encourage you to have a look and i think i'm going to stop there <laughs>